Dean Lyons, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, Haas School of Business is an outstanding school. This is much more diverse, mm. uh, and you go into uh, many other disciplines, not just focus on core idea entrepreneurship. Right. I think that's where it thrives. Right. And I wanted to learn from you, you know, mm. how you go about maintaining that uh, standards for years and years. Ah. Well, you know, we are part of this wonderful university that is Berkeley and making sure that we remain connected to it and get opportunities from it that we can deliver to our students as well as external stakeholders. I'll give you, um, I'll give you a small example. We are about to announce a brand new dual degree undergraduate program in business and engineering. And so students selected for this program would leave with both a bachelor's in science and engineering, EECS, electrical engineering, computer science, IEOR, another industrial uh, engineering, operations research, and, and Haas. And so, you know, I think we, we benefit, we'd like to think we, we also contribute to this wonder, wonderful university, but uh, benefiting from it and helping to, to, to reconfigure those uh, opportunities in fresh ways, I think that's fundamental. You also have a sizable number of uh, international students that yeah, come here. we do. Um, how do you differentiate, again, uh, between your school and the schools on the East Coast? Yeah. Well, you know, th there are t terrific schools on the East Coast as well, naturally. Uh, differentiating any educational institution, right? We, we are in a competitive environment just as, as industry is. And there are many elements. Uh, clearly, our geography is a huge advantage, right? This this Bay Area, this this ecosystem, uh, the culture that it represents, the the vitality, not just in the startup world, but certainly including that, but also, you know, most of the big companies around the world want their corporate innovation center here, right? And so, it, when sometimes I say, when if, if business schools didn't exist. Um, and you had a choice of putting a business school anywhere on the surface of the planet, you could. A lot, a lot of people around the world would, would pick this place, right? It's geography, and that's a huge advantage. So, so that's answer number one. Uh, answer number two is um, we talk a lot about culture as a separator for this geography, but uh, we've also been as, as intentional as we possibly can be as a business school to compete on culture. Can we write down a set, we call them defining principles. So we, about five years ago, we wrote down a set of four defining principles, and we used them very intensively for admissions. And we also wanted to write down a set that were true, that were valued, and that are different. Right? So this is not just four unobjectionable things. Right? This is stuff that we believe in. So an example, uh, Berkeley. Question the status quo is one of them, right? Now, if that's not Berkeley, I don't know what is. But this notion, right, this headset of, isn't there a better way to do this? That's exactly what we're looking for. And we think that's exactly what industry is looking for. Uh, I won't go through all four, but I'll give you one other example. Uh, confidence without attitude. We're a business school. Confidence is absolutely essential. We think great leadership and management comes with without the arrogance, right? It, it, it's, it's, those are the people that, that engender the kind of trust and followership that we think great leadership is made of. So those are the two quick answers. Geography is a huge advantage, and, and this culture, this sharply defined culture is a huge advantage relative to most East Coast schools, all of them, we think. So in the, in the past, uh, maybe a decade or, uh, or more ago, uh, all the big business schools uh, you know, attracted a lot of uh, consulting companies like McKinsey's. Yeah. If you went to a big school for MBA, then natural transition was to go to uh, you know management consulting. Yep. But it has changed, yeah. uh, and IT had a lot to do with it. Startup yeah. culture had a lot yeah, to do it with it. When you just spoke about um, uh, being very ambitious, but also very aggressive, and some of the schools again taking back to the East Coast were grooming, uh, mm. I, I guess intentionally or unintentionally, uh, their grads uh, to be that. But Berkeley, as you said, uh, is very different. Uh, they have been tagged as rebels over the decades, but again, they are more, I, I should say for the lack of a better term, humane mm. business managers. Um, do you think it is just part of geography or because the, the ethos has you know, grown in this region uh, and then you just cannot escape that part? I think, I think it's really more the latter. You can't, you can't separate it. It's part and parcel of the region, it's part and parcel of what Berkeley is, right? So Berkeley is a wonderful university uh, by any standard. Um, it's also public, right? So when you talk about the East Coast schools or our local neighbor that's absolutely outstanding, um, these are private schools that people generally have in mind when they use those phrases, right? And you might, 
you know, I'll put it this way. Many of our faculty choose to be here because they could be anywhere because being part of a public institution means something to them. So one of, I didn't mention it, but one of, a third of our defining principles is beyond yourself. Beyond yourself. A sense of stewardship is something beyond just you and your career. And because service to the public is in the DNA of this public institution, that we would attract managers and shape managers and put managers in the world that have more of that headset, we think is, is part and parcel of, of what this is. So it's, it's both the geography and the institution. When you look at international students, and I'm taking two countries, for example, India and China, and it's a lot of those students coming here, um, they are very academically driven and mm. very focused on academics. Uh, in fact, if you look at the top universities in India, you have to have pretty much 100% to get in there. If you get 99 percentile, then you're not in the school. Yeah. So they don't know what else to do. Mm. But our focus over generations have been just beyond academics, to be a good leader, to be a participating in a team player, yeah. okay, to take care of your, the society mm. you're living in, etc. Mm. Um, when those students come here, do you still see those subtle differences, or they are very apparent to you? And once mm. they come and leave after mm. two years, how do you see the change? Mm. Well, I think, you know, like other top business schools, we, we are selecting for people who have both. We have to. I mean, these people are so capable that society needs them to lead, right? Needs them to lead responsibly. Needs them to lead in ways that are empathic. You know, some of the other elements of what we think of as, as great leaders. The command and control leader of 50 years ago, it's sort of like organizations are different now. Gen X and other, you know, younger folks don't want to be led that way. It doesn't mean that, you know, the sort of, um, uh, you know, the quintessential command and control leader can't exist anymore. But, but it's, th that's certainly not what most business schools are trying, trying to produce, right? And, you know, it, 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 so, so w w narcissism doesn't go over well here, and, and we don't admit it. I, I mentioned the phrase confidence without attitude. So if somebody from any region, including the regions you're mentioning, or countries, if somebody applies and they have a perfect you know, exam score, GMAT score of 800 and an undergrad GPA that's nearly perfect, and we interview them and we get a sense of narcissism and arrogance, we have to admit them 0% of the time. 0%. And if somebody says, oh, but your rankings would go up if you had an 800 GMAT, it's sort of like, look, either play the strategy or leave the field, right? And that's really important to us. So because our, our full-time MBA class, for example, is 250 people, um, it's, we just have to play it straight. So I think the quick answer is we, we just we can't compromise on that front. And then the final point, if I may, is it's true even at the, at the MBA level. It's all, we have an undergraduate business school here. It, it's true at the undergrad level. What I will often say to folks is, look, you, you've got to where you are right now, and you've achieved so much, and they have because they've done very well, largely because you're a great individual contributor. And you will do your life's best work by working through and with other people. And that's a psychological shift. And that's part of what we need to know you're going to be able to do, if, even if you haven't already. You can call that leadership. You can call it whatever it is. But p part of our job is not just teaching the, the accounting and the finance and the strategy. Part of our job is affecting that identity shift. And we think that's part of what society needs. In summarization, uh, who or what kind of future leaders do you want to attract to Haas? And when they go out, how do you want them to play out their roles? Well, so I, I'm, I'm going to, if, if I may, I'm going to appeal to these, these principles because we take them super seriously. So when we talk about somebody who lives and leads and manages with a beyond-yourself way of thinking about the world, right, um, anybody who works for a person like that knows that that's where they're coming from. And if you work for a person who's not like that, a person who's profoundly self-interested, right, sort of uh, homo economicus, we used to call it, um, you know that too. And most people don't want to be led and managed by that kind of person. Uh, that's just a reality. The world needs all kinds, um, but, but that, that's the reality. So uh, this notion of, of, of stewardship or beyond yourself. Another one, that we, the fourth one that I didn't mention of these principles is students always. This idea that even at the top of your career, if you start to think you're fully baked, you don't have feedback to hear, 
and people around you think that you think you don't have feedback to hear, that's a problem. So it's not just lifelong learning. It's learning when learning is hard. So I'll give you a concrete example. I, I was in Costa Rica not long ago with my family. My, my French is pretty good. My Spanish isn't very good. But I was working very hard on my Spanish. Um, and when we went to the restaurants, my, my kids, 13 and 16, they speak better Spanish than I did. But when we went to restaurants, I noticed they were speaking English. They were defaulting English. Every time we, we were in a restaurant, I was struggling with the Spanish. I wanted them to see their dad struggle. Because learning when learning is hard. It's sort of like, are you ready? Because we're not kidding around. And people who are really learning like that their whole life long, they, they get further, they do more, they add more to society. So uh, those principles is, is sort of question the status quo. Isn't there a better way to do this? Confidence, yes, but without the attitude, without the arrogance. Students always, and not the easy way, the hard way, and beyond yourself. Those are the four things that we really look for, and those are the four, I'm going to call them leadership qualities, that we want to put more of out in the world. And that's sort of the, you know, the stand that we've taken. We're not saying everybody needs to do that. That's just where we are. All right. It's a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much.